Well, guess what? Today we're going to start a brand new series called This Good Work. And we're going to start by introducing the theme of the series. And then we're going to talk, that, that we're going to talk about over the next four weeks. And then uh, we're going to take a minute to pray about that with expectation that God will use, use uh, this series. Uh, there'll be a little break, a hiatus in the series next week, but then we'll resume back up. So I know it's a little bit different, but I just felt like I wanted to get going into this before um, life got crazier for me. So um, that's what, what you get. So, um, hey, just want to let you know, if you're the best of the best, if you're the brightest in your class, if you're the star athlete, the leader of all, I promise you, God can still use you. Because it's just that, like, our God specializes in using ordinary, everyday people. And so this series is for those of you who believe deep down that you're created for something more, that you were born for a purpose, created by God to do something eternal, something that matters. And so over the next, again, several weeks after uh, we take a little break, if you're open to what the Spirit of God would say to you, I believe that God will speak to some of you and give you the faith to either step out and do something that outlasts you, or to at least reaffirm those things you're already doing in God's plan that you've that you've that you glorify him because of the way you live your life and serve <clears throat> his purposes. But I just want to warn you, when God uses you, it always comes with a personal cost. That when you take a step of faith to do something significant, it's likely that you'll pay a price greater than you can imagine. You will likely likely experience pain, uh, fatigue, a rejection at times, maybe heartache, failure every now and then, certainly loneliness, uh, doubt, uh, discouragement. Uh, there are times you may stand alone because people just misunderstand you or make fun of you. But when your sacrifices impact another life and glorify God, you will never think about the price you had to pay. Because of your faithfulness, God will be honored and people will be different, changed for the good. And you may look like an ordinary, everyday person. You may not feel exceptionally gifted or talented, but you're the exact type of person that God wants to use. Do you believe it? Thank you. So we're going to study, a few of you do. We're going to study, hopefully by the end all of you do, but we're going to study a person from the Old Testament over the next several weeks, an ordinary guy named Nehemiah who had a broken heart for the plight of his people, and he looked on their situation and he decided, you know, I, I can't sit by anymore and do nothing. Something has to be done. It might as well be me. And so in Nehemiah 2.18 it says, so they began this good work. Somebody say this good work. Great. So the title of the series is This Good Work, and if you have faith to believe that God might stir you to do even more, would you just join your heart with mine in prayer today? Heavenly Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would stir us to believe that we could do exceedingly and abundantly more by your power to make a difference in the lives of people that you bring into our life. God, would you give us the courage and the faith to step out, would you speak to our hearts, Lord, to, to stir us, to use the gifts of those who love you, to make a difference in the lives of other people, and to glorify you in all that we do. And we pray this in the name of the one who gave us the perfect work, your son, our Savior Jesus, and all of God's people said, amen. So this week's message is called, When You Can't Take It Anymore, and we're going to start by looking at one of the most I think motivating, captivating, inspirational stories of a man, an ordinary guy in the Old Testament that made an extraordinary difference. Now, Nehemiah was not a pastor. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a king. He wasn't really a leader at this point. And he certainly wasn't a warrior either. He was just an ordinary person that God heard, I mean, that, that heard about something that broke his heart crushed his spirit to a point where he just had to do something about it. And so he was compelled to make a difference in the world around him. So again, he's just an ordinary guy, and if you don't know what he did for a living, he's actually known as a cupbearer. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes of Persia. Don't, don't try to repeat that name too many times. It's a mouthful. But um, now you may say, like, what in the world is a cupbearer? Well, that's a good question. In our context... Today, if you think of someone who is a servant or maybe a butler, 
like that might be kind of the equivalent of a cupbearer back in those days. But a cupbearer was an incredibly trusted person because they had some important responsibilities. And so if you could imagine, this guy has tremendous access to the king. And so that if the king's having you know, a private conversation, he might overhear some things, might overhear some state secrets. And, and so he's got to learn to be you know, tight-lipped about things and, and, and to be trusted. And so um, he has to keep things confidential. And so he's highly trusted, full of integrity, also incredibly loyal to the king, because the title of his job actually reveals one of the most important things that a cupbearer did. If you can imagine, in this time in history, there were constant plots to overthrow kings, and so sometimes people would try to take the life of the king. And so the cupbearer's job was to taste the wine before the king would actually drink the wine to see if the wine was poisoned or not. Anyone want to sign up for that job? I might need a cupbearer. Braxton will be my cup bear. I'm not sure if I want to drink after you, but that's okay. Um, you know, because that's just not my thing. But anyway, that's what the cup bear did, okay? And um, I don't know about you, but if I'm that guy, I hope I've got some good insurance with real benefits, right? Because any one time it goes bad, then you're out of a job, probably out of a life. And so this guy's just an ordinary person in the role of a servant attending to the needs of the king who's of a different nationality, uh, Nehemiah is, is a Hebrew, you know, his family came out of Israel, and he's working for a king of another country. And so one day Nehemiah is having this ordinary day, but then he has a conversation that moves him to a place that he's never been before. Chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Hanani, if you want to follow along, it's, your, it's, it's an insert in your bulletin. Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, but also about Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah is having a conversation with his brothers, and he says, hey, like, tell me about our people. Tell me about our homeland. And the reason Nehemiah is asking about this is because 140 years before this story, in the year 586 BC, the Babylonians, under the rule of an evil king named Nebuchadnezzar, attacked the Jewish people and completely demolished Jerusalem, their life, their culture, in a way that's very difficult you know, to describe. If you've ever heard of Solomon's temple, it was gone, it was wiped away, burned to the ground. Every building was now in rubble. The gates to the city, which formed protection, were burned to the ground. Almost everyone that they knew was now you know, without a job, without any kind of hope. And so the evil Babylonians took a giant group of young Jewish people captive, and they took them away from their homeland to Babylon and held them in bondage for a long time. And that's, you might be familiar with the story of Daniel. That's where Daniel winds up, in Babylon. And so if you can imagine, the Jewish people are demoralized, completely hopeless. What are they going to do? No, we, we have no homeland. Our life is over. Decades go by. Decades go by. And then about 50,000 Jewish men and women decide, hey, we're going to move back to Jerusalem to rebuild. Uh, over time, Persia enters the region and they get rid of the Babylonians and so now they're in charge. And they're a lot more like, hey, if you all want to go back, that's fine with us, but you know, we're not really going to help you in that endeavor. And so 50,000 Jewish men go back to try to rebuild Jerusalem and because they want to do, they want to rebuild the city of their forefathers, you know, their homeland. We're, we're going to try to make a better future. But the problem is that they couldn't get anything moving. They had no, they, they, they were stalled in a complete dead end. And that's when the brother says to Nehemiah in verse 3, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. Well, why? Because the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. In other words, with no wall, with no gates, there's absolutely no protection from the outside forces in the region that would surely attack them. There are other small nations and, and tribes and, and brigands and those kind of things. And so it was impossible to rebuild. Like there's, there's already no jobs, there's no economic system, there's no leadership, there's no direction, there's no confidence. And with no protection, there's no plan, and therefore there's no hope whatsoever. And so what do you do when you don't know what to do? Like, what do you do when you see something that breaks your heart and you know there is a good work to be done and you think maybe you're supposed to be a part of that good work? What do you do when you see something that bothers you deeply 
and you just can't take it anymore. Well, let me give you three thoughts about how to begin your good work if you haven't already begun. The first thing we see Nehemiah do is what you may end up doing at some point in your life, and that is, number one, sit down to cry. Sit down to cry and just let the injustice in the world break your own heart. And you can see this in verse 4. When I heard these things, you know, when I heard about the devastation, the hopelessness of my people, I sat down and wept. Just crushed his heart. And what's interesting is, is where Nehemiah was when he heard this news. He's about a thousand miles away from his homeland, and he's actually living a pretty comfortable life, right? I mean, he's in the palace. I mean, think about it. He's eating the same food the king eats. He's getting the same wine the king drinks. He's watching the same shows the king's watching on his giant TV. He's probably posting selfies, you know, hashtag blessed. He has like a really good life. And I don't know about you, but sometimes in my comfort, like I can be scrolling across some news story on my phone or receive a prayer request that comes in, and I think, man, that's bad. It really stinks to be them, right? I mean, they're a long ways away. What, what could I do about that? I'm living a comfortable life. I mean, I'll pray for them, but I'm not going to really let it into my heart. And at that moment, like Nehemiah had a choice. He could acknowledge the plight of his people. Oh, man, that's too bad. What a shame. I hate to hear that. I feel really bad for them. Or he could choose to let the pain in, not just in his head, but in his heart, to the point where it bothered him to stir him, to give him a divine burden, like an ache in his soul. When he heard the news, he didn't, he didn't do what's so easy to do, like, like just brush it off. He sat down, he broke down, and he started to cry. And so let me just ask you, what breaks your heart? What's, what is it that burdens you? You know, this isn't right, not on my watch. What is it that crushes your spirit when you look at some injustice? Maybe it's to a group of people or a need in this world. You know, why doesn't somebody do something about this? I mean, maybe for you, for a lot of people that I know, like in our community and in the world, you know, it has to do around children. So, so maybe for you, it's like, you know, children who can't read and you just feel this burden for them or, or children who have special needs and, and just need help and love. Maybe it's those who've been bullied or neglected or those who've been abused or maybe, you know, are, are orphaned and need a foster home or adoptive parents. I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's for those, you might know some people who have been enslaved by, by addiction and they're hostage to drugs. And, and so you want, you know, you want to do something. You don't maybe not know what that is yet, but you just feel like this burden for them. Maybe it's homelessness. You know, you see people that are really stuck in life and barely have their, their needs being met and you want to do something about it. Like maybe it's, you know, racial injustice because you're just tired of seeing that on the news. You don't think it's fair because that's not how God would treat people. And so maybe it's for those who are impoverished in another country even, like people who don't have simple, clean drinking water or a simple mosquito net in another part of the world or some drugs that would prevent diseases just for a few dollars that they don't have access to. And that just, that just nags at you and it breaks your heart because we're all different and unique people. We all have different experiences, different personalities, different skills. It's very possible that something that breaks my heart more might be something different that breaks your heart more. Because we have plenty of needs to go around. And so maybe God is calling you to fill the gap in one of those needs. Uh, maybe it's you just have a heart for those who don't know God, who haven't had a Bible translated in their language. I mean, there are literally... Millions of options here, okay? So what is it that breaks your heart? What is it that burdens your soul? Let me just tell you a couple of stories uh, that, that have changed my trajectory as a pastor, so it's a little more personal for me. Uh, years ago, when I was still new and young, some of you remember that. Um, of course, you were young and new too probably back then. But we had a young family um, who... who uh, they, they, had, they, they, they were ministering to a young man in the church who, was, uh, who they were working with, and he didn't have a healthy family background in history. He had not really been part of a church before, and he came and he, he sat up in the balcony with his baseball hat on. And early on, like a deacon came up to me and said, hey, aren't you, like, you going to tell me he's being disrespectful by wearing his hat in worship? And I said, no. 
Like, I'm just glad that he's here, right? And the deacon didn't like that. He said, no, well, that's not right. I'll go tell him. And I said, whoa, whoa, no, no, please don't do that. You better not. And I convinced him not to tell him or say anything to him until he could show me in the Bible where it says you can't wear a hat in a worship service. And he couldn't find it. And so I swore to myself at the time that we would never let man-made rules be a barrier to worshiping and discovering God and his church. Now, this was back when I wore a clergy robe, okay? Some of you may remember those days. It was a long time ago. And we had an elementary student, Colin. If you know who I'm talking about, you know who I'm talking about. He just kept calling me judge. I'm like, I'm not a judge, Colin. Well, you look like one. Why are you wearing a robe? Because well, that's what we wear. Why? I don't know. It's a good question. And so I realized that maybe what I wear might limit what people experience and think about God in the church. And so a few weeks later, I retired my robe in the service. If you were there, um, that was fun. Um, it made some people really mad at me. Oh, well, um, God bless them. And then a couple years later, a, a dearly beloved elderly man in our church died. And we did his funeral here, and I met his adult son to help plan the funeral. And he, he still lived in the area and he shared fondly about growing up in this church. He had great memories about the people who worked with him in, the, you know, in youth ministry. And he just loved you know, most of the people in the church and, and just had all these great memories as a kid. But I asked him, like, well, why did you stop participating? Because I knew he wasn't going anywhere. And this church, or any church for that matter, like, like why, why did you stop? And he got really serious. He said, Marcus, uh, when I was a young adult, when I was in my early 20s, and I worked on the farm, and I got up early on Sunday mornings to do some of the, the feeding and the chores. And one day I just kind of lost track of time. And I looked at my watch and I realized, hey, I can make it to worship, but I can't like change all my clothes. Like I can take off my boots and stuff, but I'm going to go in. It's not going to be pretty. But, you know, it's really important that I go. And so I got there and a deacon stopped me at the door and told me I wasn't welcome here unless I was dressed in my best and cleaned up. And I haven't been back to a church since. It was like more than 20 years till he came back in here for his dad's funeral to any church. Now, you can say, you know, he overreacted, whatever, that's fine. But when I heard the story, I went back to my office and I cried. And I called him later and I told him that would never happen here again as long as I'm here. I was so disturbed, so broken, so angry on behalf of a God of grace who welcomes all people from all races and backgrounds and nations, from all parts of life, whether you can dress nice or not. And on that day, I made a promise. We will have a dress code. It will be really simple. Please wear something. <laughs> now, there's a few times where I've had to say a little more, but, you know... We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't come to worship. We want to worship a God without having to judge other people and what they're able to bring or do. And so, you know, um, our God loves people where they are and invites them in. And here I am years later. And what you see here, I think, is a reflection of what broke my heart many years ago. So what breaks your heart? Will you let it in? Will, it let it, will, will you let it move you? Will you sit down to cry? Because listen to me, I don't worry what, that every now and then something makes me cry. People know that I cry all the time around here, okay? I worry, though, when it's been a long time when that hasn't happened. I want my heart to be tender, to be broken by the things that break the heart of God. So what do you do when you can't take it anymore? You sit down to cry. Number two, you kneel down to pray. Kneel down to pray. Verse 4, Nehemiah says, For some days I mourned and fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. And just, just listen to me. I'm guilty of this too. But if it's big enough to cry about, it's big enough to pray about. Because sometimes, and I've said it too, again, I'm not pointing fingers, but sometimes I hear people say it and I realize I say it sometimes. It's just a habit, but it's kind of insulting to God. I'll say something like, all we can do now is pray. And I think, God just heard that and he's thinking, all you can do now is pray. Like, I'm all powerful. Like, maybe I'm option number one, right? All you can do now is, like, like I mean, it's down to me now, God. All you, 
all things are possible with me, God, and all you can do is pray? Well, maybe you are in trouble then, right? No, God plus one is always the majority. And so Nehemiah cries out to God, verse 5, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants the people of Israel. And so Nehemiah continues in prayer by confessing his own sin and the sins of his people. He reminds God of God's promises and faithfulness, and he goes before the king and he asks permission. Can I go back and help my people to rebuild with your permission? Verse 11, he talks to God about this encounter with the king, and he says, God, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And so he prays over and over and over again. In fact, I hope you'll understand this, that what you pray about really reflects what you believe about God. What you pray about reflects what you believe about God. Because if our prayers, again, these aren't bad prayers, but if our only prayers are bless the food, keep me safe, give me a good day, You don't really believe the real power God has. But when you ask God to stretch you, to use you, when you pray for the impossible, God, move, do miracles, bring healing, spark revival, use me to meet someone's needs, then you believe in the power and glory of a good God. And so what's interesting about Nehemiah is this is actually the first of 12 prayers that he prays in the book of Nehemiah. So there's probably, you know, hundreds during this time, and we just see it. 12 of them, and we see it at the beginning of the story, we see it through the middle of the story, and we see it at the end of the story. He's always praying. And what you're going to see in the upcoming weeks is that Nehemiah is a leadership genius. He really is. He's practical, he studies, he strategizes, he can cast vision, he knows how to delegate, and yet everything he does is with intimate, faith-filled prayer before his good God. So how do you begin a good work when you can't take it anymore? You, you, you let it into your heart, and you sit down and cry. At some point, you kneel down and pray. And then once your heart's been broken and you've sought the goodness of God, number three, stand up and act. So Nehemiah takes the cup, and he goes to visit the king, and he, his heart is heavy, and the king can tell. Verse 4, the king said to me, what is it you want? And then watch him again. Here's like a little flare prayer. Here it comes. Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Like like my people are hurting, the walls are down, the city is exposed, and I can't sit around and do nothing. Somebody has to do something about this. It might as well be me. Stand up to act. Like, I didn't always know I was going to go into pastoral ministry. If you had told me at the age of 18, I would have laughed, okay? I really would have. In fact, I laughed when I thought about it a couple years after that. But while I was in college, um, I had recommitted my life to God. I realized something bothered me. Something I mean, it didn't literally make me cry, but it really disturbed me. It was the reality that so many people my age and my friend group didn't know Jesus, And it showed in how they conducted their lives with little hope and lots of abandon. And so I found God's love like overwhelming and it filled me with things like love and joy and hope. And so my sophomore year of college, I was asked to lead a Bible study as part of my involvement in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And the study grew and some kids came to Christ. So then they put me in charge of evangelism for the college chapter. Finally, my InterVarsity staff worker, Kent Wally, he finally asked me over a meal. He said, hey, have you ever considered like going into vocational ministry after college? Vocational ministry? You're talking like pastoring? Like, yeah, I think you have the gifts to do that. It's like, no, nah, I don't think so. I said, well, I'm just asking you to pray about it. Just pray about it. And so I spent the next few months praying about that, and God orchestrated events and relationships to where I decided to go, in, to, go to seminary I just felt like I had to at least take some action, take the next step to see whether that's what I was supposed to do. And so sure, like I can share my faith wherever I live, learn, work, or play. All of us should be doing that. But some of us are called by God to equip others to do that more effectively. And so I went into seminary, youth ministry, and then finally you got stuck with me. But let the, let the burden 
overwhelm you and you're going to sit down and cry about it and then you're going to kneel down and invoke the power of God and then at some point God's going to give you a solution or a direction or other people to work with and you'll need to stand up and act. And let me just insert something that's not in the notes but I thought about in the early service. I do realize that there are a lot of people because of their life stage. This isn't very easy. You know, I'm thinking of people who are, are, you know, like my dad who's, you know, um, in his 80s now. Like, he's not going to probably do something new, though he did do something in his 70s that was pretty remarkable. But, you know, like for him, I don't know what I would say for him to do next. But here's what I learned since I've been at First Christian Church. When I first got here, we had a prayer group. And, I, and I, I use this term endearingly, but they were little old ladies, okay? They were all elderly women, and we used to meet in the conference room. This is when I first got here. People like Mary Sue Stevens and um, um, uh, Charlene Harris and Georgia Kelly and Evelyn Lovell, and I'm probably missing a few more, um, Ms. Congleton. So there was lots of them, okay? And Wow, I mean, and here I'm like a 30-year-old pastor, and they are teaching me all kinds of things about prayer. Evelyn couldn't see. She could barely, like, see things in front of her face. But she prayed so incessantly and with power. It was like the room shook, and I was like, hey, I'd rather spend 15 minutes with her praying because what power I just felt from her, like, emanating from the Holy Spirit through her. And so, again, I would just say, like, if you're stuck At least do step two, right? You can always pray. It doesn't matter where you are in your life or what situation you're in. You can be praying for others to accomplish what you wish would be done in the world. If you can't get to number three right now, don't just ignore it all. Take that burden and keep praying. But who am I? Like, you know, I'm not the pastor. I'm not trained. I don't have a lot of experience. But listen to me, and I hope you understand this. You don't have to be appointed by man if you are called by God. You don't have to be chosen by people if God prompts your heart, stirs your spirit, and gives you a burden. You just step into it. You trust him and watch him act. You feel the presence of God stirring you. It breaks your heart. Why does it break your heart? Because perhaps you, like Nehemiah, just an ordinary guy in every other respect, was chosen by God to step into a burden and start a good work. Now, Nehemiah doesn't finish it alone. He could not have done it alone. He needed the power of God and he needed a lot of other people to help him. But someone had to start. So even if you're not a starter, you can join with someone who's already on that mission and help them accomplish it. But first we have to sit down and pray, I mean sit down and cry, kneel down and pray, and at some point stand up and act. We're going to pick up there in two Sundays and get a lot more specific on July 9th. Let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, we ask that by the power of your spirit, you would speak to us today. Would you stir up some people in your church to do or to continue to do your work? And as you're praying today, those of you that are followers of Christ and you you want to be more open to what God might do through you, you're available, you'll let the pain in, You'll let it break you. You'll ask God to use you. If you believe God uses ordinary people just like you and just like me, and you want God to do more through you, would you just lift up your hands right now? Thank you. Lord, I thank you for people that are not priests or prophets or kings, but God, in your kingdom, they are your missionary servants. Give us opportunities to serve you. We ask for your power, your provision, your protection, your wisdom, your direction to guide every step we take. I pray that wherever we go and whatever we do, we would do it for your glory. So stir up within us, Lord. Break our hearts that we might act on your behalf to do your will on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.